So, can dog training be positive only? Well, it is kind of not as simple as yes or no. I'll explain. Jose here from Train Me Please. In many parts of the world, in just a few decades, we went from this to this. In dog training, we have made tremendous progress over the last 20 or even 40 years. Nowadays, I often go for a walk and see people with their dogs with a treat pouch full of reinforcers for the dog. This is absolutely amazing and a sign that we have made lots of progress in the animal welfare space. So, can we train dogs using positive reinforcement only? This is sort of the wrong question to ask. You see, this is a tricky topic and I certainly have as many questions as I have convictions. Let me start out by saying outright that in this video it is not my aim to criticize anyone's practices and ideas, but instead to have a healthy discussion. Any animal, dogs obviously included, will always be exposed to a variety of experiences that will determine how they perceive the world. From reinforcement to punishment, positive or negative, classical conditioning and a whole heap of other procedures. All of them will happen and will take place. That's a given. Can we, as dog trainers, owners and tutors, make choices that makes life better for them? We sure can. When we are trying to teach something to our dogs, there are a variety of options on how to go about it. How to decide which way to go is something that has been shaped by our experiences, perceptions and the information we have at that point in time. For me, when deciding on a strategy to train or teach a dog, I always like to ask myself the following questions. 1. Is this the easiest way for this dog to learn? 2. How can I make this as fear-free as possible? 3. How can I prepare the situation so that the dog can easily succeed? 4. What is the best way to get the dog to seek reinforcers in this situation? Another thing I often find helpful is to look at something like the hierarchy of behavior change procedures by Dr. Susan Friedman or the least intrusive, minimally aversive Lima approach. These guidelines are great to put us on a path to a certain behavior training goal with the least amount of risk of producing adverse side effects. Linda Michaels' hierarchy of dog needs is another elegant approach that lists several dog-friendly options to consider for dog training, as well as other important needs for them. As you can see, there is a lot of force-free training goodness to explore out there. The reason we want to be careful about how we train our dogs is because some procedures, such as positive punishment, for example, carry a much higher risk of causing stress and anxiety when compared with some of the low-risk options, such as antecedent modification and positive reinforcement. In some situations, the higher-risk options can even cause the dog to completely shut down, which is not something we want. This is why most fear-free and force-free trainers, myself included, pay a lot of attention to the dog's physical well-being and prioritize to a massive extent the use of good antecedent arrangement and positive reinforcement. With all that said, there can be some very specific circumstances in which you might have to find solutions outside the premise of antecedent arrangement and positive reinforcement. If such a situation presents itself, it does not mean that we cannot find solutions that minimize fear and hesitation for our dogs. Let me give you an example. Say that you are working with a rescue dog. This dog lives in an enclosed pen and does not like anyone to get close to him. He is not taking food and from your observations, he really does look like all he wants is people to move away and stay away from him. Let's say that you realize that you might need to deploy a negative reinforcement contingency here. Just because we are using negative reinforcement, it does not mean that we cannot use a shaping plan to teach this dog. We can certainly do training by approximations in this scenario. Giving him as much distance from you as possible, you can briefly appear and if he does not react, you go away. You can then increase criteria and require the dog to look at you or maybe even to take a casual step in any direction to make you go away again. You could continue this process until the dog is actually approaching you. This can work. 
I would, however, tweak this a little bit as early as possible. I think that it would be very helpful to get the dog to allow for some proximity because he is seeking some reinforcers such as food treats. For example, if you see the dog showing less hesitation and perhaps even approaching you more readily, he may be ready to accept some delicious treats. Gently toss them in and for the first few times I would probably still recommend walking away. If this works and the dog is now taking treats, that's awesome news. We have successfully pivoted from negative reinforcement to positive reinforcement, mixed up with some classical conditioning goodness. We can increase criteria from there and get the dog to come closer and hopefully we will soon have a dog that is wishing for you to show up so that he can approach and get his treats. If the dog is not taking treats, you can continue the previous procedure a little longer until the dog's behavior tells you that he might be ready to receive some other reinforcers. So as you can see here, we managed to use negative reinforcement in a way that still offered the dog some control over what happens and also in a way that minimizes stress and anxiety. Contrast this with an approach in which you just go in and force that proximity from the get-go. It can work, sometimes. Sometimes it will work faster than what I have just described. Other times it might result in an unpleasant or even dangerous situation. I should mention here that this procedure assumes that what the dog wants early in the process is distance from you. If the dog is interested in something you have from the start, then none of this applies because you can use positive reinforcement, a preferred procedure, to shape the behaviors you want. Let me know in the comment section below if this procedure makes sense to you. Have you ever considered shaping for negative reinforcement procedures? I am super curious to know. Hey guys, quick side note here. The graphics for that example actually give me a lot of work to prepare. If you want to show your support for that effort, click that like button under the video. I certainly appreciate it. Thank you. Now, back to the video. The best decision will sometimes require you to think about the behavior science side of things, but also to consider ethics. What is the best thing I can do for my dog in this situation? I've said it in many of my other videos and I will repeat it here. I always encourage pet owners to hire certified fear-free professionals to help them with their dogs. I will leave links with lots of additional information in the description under the video. One thing that is incredibly important for anyone living with a dog is to never stop learning. I confess, for example, that it is almost guaranteed that at some point in time I will learn new things and develop slightly different perceptions regarding the topics that I'm sharing with you in this video. In my opinion, that is okay and should actually be encouraged. Continue to go and find helpful information that can make your interactions with your dog the best for both of you. We are all at some point in the learning curve and there will always be new things to find and new people to learn from. Dogs are amazing. They are fantastic. We owe it to them. Have a good one. Cheers.